Some people I see them when they come for a divorce, or when they need counsel, or when they have a problem. So most of the time when I see someone knocking on my door downstairs in the man's office, I feel terrified because I know that this guy or this lady has a problem. Before we start, we have to emphasize the fact that men and women are equal before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and before the law, but they are different. And I mentioned this in a previous lecture. When the Prophet was asked about women, he said, Hunna The Prophet said that women are the second half of men. And the word he used is shaqa'i which is the plural of ship, half. And we use this word when we talk about beans, for example. If you split a bean into half, then you have one half and the other half. And this is the word that the Prophet ﷺ chose. Hunna shaqari kurijat. When you look at the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, most of the time it would be talking about men and women as equal. Inna al-Muslimina wa al-Muslimat wa al-Muminina wa al-Muminat wa al-Salimi to the end of the process. Indeed, the believing men and the believing women. The fasting men and the fasting women. Till the end of the verse, then it gives the reward for both. We know that in Islam, if a Muslim man prays, for example, and a Muslim woman prays, they get the same reward. If they fast, they get the same reward. If they do something wrong, both of them will get the same punishment. Like if a man steals, he will get the same punishment that a woman gets if she steals. So men and women in Islam are equal but different. Equal but different. In the same way that me and Brother Abdul Rahman, for example, are equal but different. I'm a man, he is a man, but we are equal but different. We are not identical. If you don't think that women and men are different, inshallah you will fail your biology class a big time, as I always say. And number two, although they talk about equality all the time in, in North America, but uh, one reason they have different restrooms for men and women at a, a superstore or Walmart and public places is because men and women are different. They are different. And therefore, they have different roles and different responsibilities in the society. Most of the problems I'm going to talk about in the coming slides are because people don't really understand this ruling in Islam, that men and women are equal but different. They have different roles and different responsibilities in the society. The first one reason why Muslim marriages fail is because at the time of choosing a future husband or future wife, we don't make the right choice. We don't have our priorities in order. We don't have the right criteria for choosing uh, the right husband or the right wife. The other thing I want to mention before we start, every time the Prophet talks about the criteria for choosing the right wife, like for example, في الحديث تنكح المرأة لأربع لمالها وحسابها ولجمالها فافطر بذات الدين تائبة يداك. When the Prophet says that a woman is to be married for four reasons: for her money, for her beauty, for her uh, social status, for her and her family, and the last thing is religion, the deen. And the Prophet says, go for the deen, go for the lady with the deen. The same is also to be applied for a lady looking for a husband. Because the hadith of the Prophet can be understood to be talking to feminines and masculines. And if he is talking about choosing the future wife, it also means choosing the future husband. So we apply the same thing to the husband. In the other hadith, which is authentic, the Prophet says, if a man comes to you with a good faith and a good manners, marry him to your daughter, otherwise there will be chaos and corruption in 
your society. The same also applies to the lady. If your son is proposing to a right lady, he shouldn't stand against it just because the status of the family of the wife is lower than yours. A few days ago, this brother was asking me that his family is against his marriage because his wife's uh, family, they work as uh, shoemakers back home in their country. And for them, this is not acceptable in their culture. Although in Islam it's okay, so what's wrong if, if the wife is poor? But she is a righteous lady. And the ruling in fiqh is, if a man wants to get married to a lady which is socially below him, then he should get married to her as long as she is a righteous person, even if his family is against it. Otherwise, he will be disobeyed a lot. So what about if he is actually already married to the lady? Should he divorce her just because his mother is not happy because the lady is from a poor family? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nur, إِنْ يَكُونُ فُقَرَاءَ يُغْنِيهِمُ اللَّهُ مَنْ فَضْلِهِ If the lady is poor, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enrich her and her family from his grace and from his bounty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provider. الحسن البصري رحمه الله جاءه رجل وسأل يعني تقدم بعض الناس لتزوج ابنته فقال ممن تزوج ابنتي فقال له الحسن البصري زوجها من يخاف الله فإن أحبها أكرمها وإن أبغضها لم يظلمها. So a man came to الحسن البصري and said that several people are proposing for my daughter. To which one of them shall I marry my daughter? So Al Hassan al Basri said, Marry her to the righteous one. If he loves her, he will honor their relationship. But if he doesn't love her, then he will not be unjust to her. He will be kind to her, although he is not in love with her. Al Arab Yaqulu, La Tanqihu al Annana, Wal al Annana, Wal al Hannana. ولا الشداقة ولا الحداقة ولا البراقة. Does anyone understand anything from this saying? It's difficult to understand in Arabic. الأنانة التي تتحدث عن نفسها أو أو يعني she's complaining all the time. So the Arabs say there are several women that you should not get married to. And as I said, you apply the same thing to men. Don't marry an Annana, the one who complains all the time. She's complaining all the time. The second one, Al Manana, the one who is always proud and always boastful. She feels like she's better than her husband. Maybe because she has a better degree, she has a better job, she, she's always looking down upon her husband. So don't marry this kind of woman and don't marry this kind of man. Al Hanana, the one who is in love with another person. Like she was forced to marry you, but she is in love with another person. So if you know this about the lady, that she is uh, desperate in love with another person, don't even propose to the lady. Otherwise, your life will be miserable. Al Shaddaqa, the one who talks all the time. She talks all the time. You can never shut her down. She always talks, even in her sleep. Al-Haddaqa alati da'iman tanzur ila ma fi aydi al-nas. Yani, nadar alayna bayi. The Haddaqa, this lady, is the one who always look to what in people's hands. She is never satisfied with what Allah gives her. She is always looking to other people. And she makes her life, his husband's life, miserable. البراقة يعني التي لا تحتشم في لبسها وتتزين الآخرين في الشارع. So this type of lady who doesn't dress decently and she always puts her beauty in display outside the house. Inside the house, she looks like Shrek's sister. Have you seen Shrek? The ogre. But outside, mashallah, she is sharp. She is beautiful. In the house, she smells like garlic and onions. But in the street, she smells very beautiful. 
In the house, she speaks with a very uh, manly voice. But in the street, she is very feminine or feminine. The other thing, and the last point I want to mention in this reason before I move on is sometimes uh, when people get married young, okay, they just get, get married because their families told them to. Like, they get married in some cultures when they are 13, 14, 15, so their dad told them to get married, so they get married. They don't know why, but we're going to have fun, but other than this, they don't know anything about marriage. So, these marriages usually fail, because at some point in the marriage, the boy or the girl will realize that we were not ready for this kind of commitment with that magnitude. Or, I got married to the wrong person. The second reason, we're going to have fun in a, in a minute. The second reason is, the husband and the wife are not connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most of the time, the first question I ask people when they come to me for a divorce, uh, so I always ask them when they come to me, do you got pray? And the usual, the typical answer I get from them is, we don't pray. So if both of you are not having a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so how do you expect Allah to bless your life and make peace between you and your wife? Another time, about two years ago, I met this lady from one of those countries that give more importance to how you look, or actually they give more importance to the biha food than how you, your relation is with the lost Canada. So this lady came to me in tears and she said, my, my husband says, if you don't take off your hijab, I'm going to divorce you. So let me repeat this again. The lady came to me in tears and she said, my husband says, if you don't take off your hijab when you go out the house, I'm going to divorce you. Why? Because he said, you don't look good in the hijab. You look old. Okay. I told the lady, the rule is in fact, there is no obedience to anyone in disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If your husband is asking you not to pray or not to wear the hijab, don't obey him. The next time he talks to you, tell him, if you ask me again to take off the hijab, I want a divorce and Allah will give me a better husband than you. For two years after this, during my stay in Clinton, South Carolina, she told me that he never told her to take off her hijab. Because he knew that she was taking her hijab seriously. And the crazy thing is usually the husband would come and complain that his wife is not wearing the hijab. And this happened like three days ago. But not the other way around. So, if the husband and wife are not living according to the Quran and Sunnah, we expect many problems to happen to them. The reason is their priorities are not in order. They are not living to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to please the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are just living like non-Muslims, so to say. I'm not saying that non-Muslims are bad. There are so many people that are decent within the non-Muslim community. But we say that we have a law and we have a constitution. The Quran and the Sunnah are our law and our constitution. So for example, if you have a problem between the husband and wife, they would probably never think of going to the shaykh to solve the problem. Or read in the Quran and Sunnah how to solve the problem. They go straight, you know, to the court, the mahkam, to take care of the problems. But Allah and His Prophet or the shaykh, they are not even in the list. And therefore, these marriages fail. If you don't have Allah and the Prophet in your relationship, how can you respect your wife or how can you respect your husband? 
If you don't have this fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how are you going to honor your relationship? You don't. And I'm not, this is, you know, I'm not going to the other extreme. Some people come to me and they say that their husbands drink or cheat on them. And this is the other extreme. So again, if you don't have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life, you are disconnected from a uh, first relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will not bless your life. Number three. Yeah, different colors. Marriages fail because from the very beginning, these guys were not the right match for one another. Maybe the brother is a very excellent guy. And the sister is a very excellent sister. But there is no chemistry. Okay? If the brother is good and the sister is righteous and good, mashallah, this is not a guarantee that the marriage will succeed. And we read in the stories of the Sahaba that some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they divorced their wives, although both of them were great guys. But it didn't work out. They don't have anything in common. Like the husband is Republican and the wife is a Democrat. He is a vegetarian and she is, a, what is the word? Carnivore. She can eat anything. Like anything that walks on four feet, two feet, no feet. There are different, absolutely nothing in common. Okay? They always fight when they sit in front of a TV. She always wants to watch free wrestling and fighting games. He wants to watch hockey. So they always have problems in the house. Okay? She wants her son to go to the middle school and he wants his son to go to uh, what? What? Cooking school, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I didn't know that they have schools for cooking. Thank you. So you have to make sure before you get married that you have something in common with the lady. Number four, and this is the sad reality. In a particular culture, in our marriage, actually there are two or three cultures that I know of, who, of course, they came here like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, mashallah, they brought up excellent children, daughters, but they don't feel comfortable marrying a daughter to someone from this culture. So, in the summer vacation, when they go back home, they force their daughter to marry someone from their culture, especially her cousins. <laughs> and she probably has sat with this guy for only two hours before, you know, she, the family forced her to marry the guy. This is your cousin, you have to marry him, you have to honor my word. I gave my brother my word, so you have to honor it. Otherwise, I will look, I will look bad. So, I mean, who cares if you look bad? We should care more if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with this marriage or not. And the Prophet says in the hadith that if a lady is forced to marry someone against her will, the marriage is not a boy if the lady wants to. And this is in hadith in, uh, in uh, Musa al-Imam Ahmad wa Tirmidhi wa Ibn Majah that a lady came to the Prophet and said that my husband forced me to marry someone liyafa khasisa. My, my, my father is from uh, a low class in the society. And the husband or the one who's proposing is rich and he is from the upper class. So my father is forcing me to marry this guy against my will. I hate his guts. So the Prophet said that if you don't want, want to marry him, then the marriage is null and void. 
the marriage is not, is not valid Islamically. She said, no, I want to marry him, but I wanted to teach the other ladies in the community that we have the final word in marriage. We actually have a say in choosing our future husband. So please, if you are a father or are you are a mother, don't marry your daughter against her will. This is against Islam. If you follow the news, Fox News and other conservative media, they always blame arranged or forced marriages on Islam. They think that this is part of the Islamic teaching, that we force our girls to marry people they don't like because Islam is telling us to. But this is wrong. Islam says marry them to the person they love. Also in the hadith, the Prophet says that you have to give the permission of the lady before the marriage. And when I marry some people in this community and also the registers in Muslim country, they have to talk to the lady face to face and ask if she wants to marry the guy or not. Okay. Some of the marriages fail because, mashallah, we have great actors and great actresses in the Muslim community. They give the Oscars. Okay? So, mashallah, before the, uh, before the marriage, you know, the brother is sitting with his uh, to be in laws, and if he hears the event, mashallah, he runs to the masjid, and he is panting behind the Imam in the light, and, and he is sweating, you know. And every time they invite him to lunch, Okay, sorry, you know, uh, today is Sunday and, uh, and Friday and I'm fasting today because the Sunnah is the Prophet on the And actually this is not in the Sunnah, the, the guy just making it up. <laughs> Monday, Thursday, Friday, but not Sunday and Friday. And of course, mashallah, the Sibha, the prayer beads, and the Jalbiya, and Kabir al-Hajjaj. You go to the house, she will tell you, MashaAllah, Ta'arif ya, you know ya, ya Nabil, MashaAllah, I've been reading the Quran like day and night. Wallah, you see, I finished 40 juz from the Quran in the past month. There are only 30. But she doesn't know. Do you want me to read for you? And she's holding the Quran upside down. Because the sucker can't read. So we are acting. We pretend to have good personalities before marriage. And after marriage, you know what happens? Shrek and who else? Who? Fiona, yes. The monster. You got this brother who smokes, but before the marriage, he pretends he doesn't smoke. Well, this guy, he has a very uh, hot temper. He can't control himself. He always fights with the flies flying on his nose, as they say in the air. Some of them lie about their past. They lie about their careers, about different things. And if you want to be salut, I don't know if you can talk, I don't know if you can talk, I don't know if you can talk, I don't know if you can talk. وبعد الجواز التاجر يكتشف ان هو تاجر مخدرات. ما هو فن التكييف برضه تكييف. بيكيف الناس. You got this guy, they ask him before marriage how much you make per month. So he will say, for example, me and, and my boss, we make 150,000 bucks a year. Okay, we're not talking about your boss, we're talking about you. Okay. The sucker is making 7,000 bucks a year. Okay. So all I'm saying is you have to be straightforward. If you have a, a problem with anything, like you snore, you snore. You got to tell the lady that I snore. And the people in Red Deer will hear me while I'm asleep. I, I have this problem, and inshallah I'm working on solving the problem. I have a temper problem. 
and I need to take some anger management classes so I, you know, control myself. Or the lady, for example, will say, you know, I have this, you know, backbiting problem. And most likely the other side will appreciate your honesty and you will not fly. They will not run away. They will help you get over this problem in your personality. But if you keep pretending to be someone you are not before the marriage, then after the marriage you get, you show the, the true face, the, the true color, then you end up having a divorce. So people always act in terms of their personality. They, they pretend to be a better they, better me, or in terms of the religion. They are very practicing, mashallah, they are very good, they are very righteous. Then after the marriage, you realize you are married to a zindiq, a fasik. Okay. The zombie dude. That is the husband. Some of the husbands are very cheap and stingy. Mashallah, as I said, before the marriage they are very, uh, very generous. They take the lady every day to uh, Tim Hortons. <laughs> oh, I gotta think of something better than this. <laughs> The marriage, then they are very steep, uh, cheap and stingy. Okay? Islamically, you have to provide the wife and the family from your own means. Okay? I'm not asking you to live in credit and to live beyond your means. Live according to your means. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, the unfit do sa'atin in sa'atin. Let the husband provide according to his or her own means. In Masal of Yulu Amir, this proverb we have in Egypt that says, stretch your feet according to the length of your sheet. But if you stretch it longer than your sheet, your feet will not be covered when you sleep. Number two, of course, the uh, the husbands are very sweet before marriage, talking to the lady, calling her every two minutes, and they pay like 5,000 bucks in bills to Philo and tell us. But after the marriage, you never hear anything from them. The guy lost the ability to speak, okay? Or they are busy with their friends, they travel all the time, they, are, they have no time for the lady. If you look at the hadith of Umm Muzar, this hadith is a very long hadith, like one and a half pages if you read the hadith. It's an authentic hadith. The Prophet ﷺ came to the house one day and Aisha anha told him, I got a story to tell you. Those ten ladies sat together before Islam and they described their husbands. And the Prophet ﷺ waited for the hadith to be finished for about 30 minutes and he was listening attentively to every word that Aisha had to say and the Prophet commented at the end of the hadith at what she said. So he was a good listener to his wife. He paid attention to his wife. Sometimes, and this is the sad reality, because we want to make sure that our families live a good life. We want to buy them the, the uh, fancy house they need and the fancy car and so on and so forth. We work two or three shifts to provide for the family and sometimes we don't have any time for them. If this is the case, at least you give one day off at the end of the week and dedicate this whole day with your undivided attention to the family. Take them somewhere they like, invite them to a restaurant, I recommend seafood Chinese restaurants, okay? And talk to your wife and talk to your children. The other thing is, 
Some husbands treat their wives as slaves, I'm sorry to say, because they think that the lady has to do everything in the house, he just sits there, is uh, smoking shisha or dope or uh, weed or marijuana or those different names, and he's not doing anything in the house, like this guy, crazy, lazy guy. The Prophet although the Prophet at, point, at some point in his life, time, he was, he had several wives, but still he would meet, you know, he would take care of his clothes, he would patch his clothes, he would fix his shoes, he would milk his goat. He could have just given orders around, you do this, you do this, you do this, but he was taking care of himself, cleaning his stuff and patching his clothes. You should care about your wife and, and you should have some light moments and light conversations with your wife. You should listen to her. Because after a week long of work serving the kids and doing the dishes and cooking and cleaning and all that stuff, the lady has to talk to someone. And if you are not a good listener, then she will talk to other people and complain. And we don't want you to be the, in, in this miserable situation. Otherwise, it will reach a point where the wife will just uh, choke you in your sleep. And the first thing they read in the paper the next morning, he died peacefully in his sleep. This is what they always say if the guy is killed by his mad wife. And I don't want you to be like this husband in this video.
And also, sometimes, at least once a week. So what, what, what is wrong if, if you cook for your wife once a week? You take your family out, or at least if you don't have the time to, why don't you cook dinner for your wife? Even if you just boil some eggs. You just show your wife that you care, that you are helping your wife. Now we 
doesn't have money. This is a shame. When I gave him some candy, it hurt some candy, I told her to leave. <laughs> Chicken. 
people of knowledge. Talk to the Imam. Talk to the people who care. Okay? The other thing is, some people connect their house to a hotline with their mom. Okay, mom, you look to me this morning, and I, you know, I don't, I, I don't think that was the right look. He was giving me the wicked look. What? Like, they talk about trivialities to, to the family. And then the, uh, the mother might live like 15,000 miles away. And she's bothering her mom. Like, you know the time difference? Like, there's 12 hours time difference. It is here at noon time, and there is like 3 a.m. in the morning. She's calling her mom in tears. Oh, mommy, this morning I, I asked him if he loves me, and he said that uh, he has to go to work. Uh, why would you bother your mom with something like this? I'm sure that your mom and dad already have enough on their plates. Okay? Don't bother them with these small things. And Alhamdulillah, we are old enough, intelligent enough, knowledgeable enough to take care of our issues. Okay? And every time I get some, I meet someone in my office, I tell them, I want you to build this uh, husband, wife, circle of trust. Take care of your problems. Don't get your families involved in everything. Okay, because once you get them involved, things will be difficult to, to control. And they might give you the wrong advice. So don't involve your family in everything or any uh, difference you have in the house. Take care of your problems, because everyone has his or her own problems. Number 11, most of us, most of us, don't have adequate ikhtilaf or the etiquettes of disagreement. Uh, this guy is telling me, no, the lady is telling me, if you were my husband, I would poison your coffee. And he said, if you were my wife, I would drink it. He would be willing to die. <laughs> the first rule in adequate ikhtilaf is, you have one tongue, two ears, and two lips, so you would listen twice as much as you speak. So Allah created two ears for you and two lips for a reason. Not just for fun. Okay? So you would talk half of what you hear. But the problem is, the husband and the wife, they just keep interrupting, keep yelling and screaming, and they are not even listening, and they don't show respect to one another. Look at this beautiful hadith. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah was a calf. Okay? And he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to bribe him, to leave his lap and stop preaching. He spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, in this authentic hadith, if you want money, we will make you the richest among us. He's bribing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you want women, we will marry you the most beautiful Women, we will marry you to Miss Arabia. Okay? If you want positions, we will make you king over us. The Prophet in this hadith, go read it, never interrupted him. And at the end, the guy finished, he put a full stop, a period, he didn't say anything. Then the Prophet says, Afarihta Abel Walid. The Prophet said, Are you done, Mr. Abel Walid? And he is calling him by his eldest son's name. And this is a way of showing respect to someone in their, in their culture. If you call me Abu Ziyad or Abu Yasmin, you are showing me respect. So the Prophet was asking, are you done with your argument, mister? And he showed him respect. He said, yes. Then the Prophet said, would you like to listen to my rebuttal or answer to what you said, Qadana. He said yes. The Prophet said, would you like to listen to my answer to what you said? So the man said yes. Then the man who was a captain put his hands behind his back and he started listening and the Prophet recited Surah for Salat to him. So the Prophet although he was talking to a captain and who came to bribe him and insult him, he never interrupted him. And after he finished, he said, are you done 
until I talk. Number five, he called him by a beautiful name, showing respect to him. Number six, he asked for his permission to give him the answer. Six days. And he was talking to a Catholic. So what about talking to your husband who is not a Catholic? Would you show him the same respect <clears throat> that the Prophet have showed to this guy? Okay. <clears throat> Euphemisms. Some of us are what we call in Arabic, Madam. They just can't pick their words when they speak to their husbands and wives. Okay? They don't know nothing about euphemisms. Shana Sha'arawi Al-Qawwil Rahimahullah Inna Al-Hakadiqa Murra Fal-Tamisu Laha Khifat Al-Bayan Truth hurts, so make sure that you express your feelings in an artistic way without hurting the other person's feelings. <clears throat> this is just like in English, uh, if someone is crippled or handicapped, they say he is physically challenged. They use a nice word so they don't hurt the guy's feelings. <clears throat> in this Western culture, they mentioned that they are very uh, professional with, with using euphemisms, especially with haram stuff. So if they talk about usury, riba, they use interest. So it's a very beautiful word. If they talk about alcohol, which is haram in all cultures, they call it spirits. If they talk about fornication or adultery, they give it a beautiful name, boyfriend, girlfriend, making love, they just give it beautiful names. And so on and so forth. So why don't you use the same thing with your wife? When you talk to your wife, you want to uh, criticize something that is not good that she made, why don't you put it in a good way? Uh, if she is asking you about something and you know that if, if you tell her the truth, if you are very straightforward with her, she will kill you, choke you in sleep, die peacefully in your sleep, then you have to use euphemisms. If she asks you, for example, how do you feel about her cooking? You say, honey, Allah, I've never eaten anything like this. And it is true. <laughs> in the back of your mind, you say, what the heck is this? But you say, mashallah, you are a unique cook. And, everything. and even if you go after this to the restroom, you throw up, it's not a problem. Okay? But don't hurt the lady's feel. She has been standing in the kitchen for two hours cooking for you and the kids. Don't hurt her feelings. Okay? Euphemisms, euphemisms, in Kinayat, in Kinayat, expressing something bad or something terrible in a very nice way. And it is going to be very useful in your practical life. Sometimes you can say something in a bad way, and it is the truth, but you, you can say it in another way using good words. And I'll give you a true story. In the Indian culture, they said that there was this king. He had a vision, so he invited guys to in interpret the dream for him. <clears throat> so this idiot came in and he said, Mr. King, this is the interpretation of the dream. He said, you die, your family will die. The interpretation of the dream is, your family will die and you will die after them. So the king got so mad, he said, throw him to the lions. Then another idiot came in, he said exactly the same thing. He was telling the truth. The interpretation of the dream is, like the, the king saw in a, in a vision that his teeth were falling. And it is true, it is true, according to the, to the science of interpreting dreams,
<laughs> of course, he didn't want to, uh, to be lunch for the lions or dinner for the crocs. So he said to the king, the interpretation of your dream is national good news. Your family will live a long life and you will be the last of them to die. He said exactly the same thing that the two idiots before him said, but in a nice way. Your family will die, will die for him. He said the same thing, but in a nice way. Of course, they gave him a big reward. They chopped his head off. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Use euphemisms in your life. <clears throat> Sometimes, when you have a disagreement with our husbands and wives, uh, we don't show the proper Islamic etiquette of disagreements. And maybe one day, inshallah, I'm going to give a, a talk about how to, to have Islamic disagreements. And yeah, that will be the The etiquette of disagreement with other people, with your wife, with your husband, with your friends in Islam. There are etiquettes for this, adab. So we forget about all these adabs, and we're going to read a poem for you between a husband and wife. They have a disagreement, and they're saying a poem, and they're not showing respect to one another. And we need to, uh, can you read it? Can you? Okay. <laughs> Oh, so the wife says, I wrote, name on, I, wrote, I wrote your name on the sand, it got washed. I wrote your name in the hair, it was blown away. Then I wrote your name in my heart, and I got a heart attack. So the husband replies, God saw me hungry, he created pizza. God saw me thirsty, he created Pepsi. He saw me in the dark, he created light. He saw me without problems, he created you. <laughs> then the wife says, twinkle, twinkle, little star, you should know what you are. And once you know what you are, the, rest, the mental hospital is not so far. <laughs> <laughs> so the husband says, the rain makes all things beautiful, the grass and the flowers too. If rain makes all things beautiful, why doesn't it rain on you? Oh. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Roses are red, but it's monkeys like you should be kept in the zoo. Don't feel so angry, you will find me there too. Not in a cage, but laughing at you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. 
soccer. Okay. Islamically, this is not acceptable. Okay? You have to be straightforward and honest with the lady. If you are coming here for the green card, let her know that I love you, honey, but things are not very well here with me. And of course, I think if I come to Canada, if I go to the northern pole, inshallah, I might have a better life. I will be cool all the time. So give me a hand. But deception is not acceptable as well. Marry the lady, taking the lady as a bridge to green card, then putting her down, forsaking her after getting your green card, then you go and marry the most beautiful lady in your country back home is not acceptable. <clears throat> Number 13, and the last one for today, is Mostly when a Muslim brother gets married to a non-Muslim lady, mostly for the citizenship purposes, or even if he loves her, after they get children, they start the problems. The lady, even, even before, even before, even before they got married, she never went to, 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 uh, to the church. She is not practicing at all. And the only time she went to school, to, uh, to church before they got married, was by mistake, thinking it was Walmart. Okay, she, she, she made a mistake. But now, once they have kids, the lady starts going to the church, wearing the biggest crucifix in the house, hanging crosses all over, and Jesus with long hair, blue eyes, although he, Jesus never had long hair or blue eyes. And, and I don't think this is because of her. Most of the time, her fat, the pressure from her family. You see, now his kids are becoming Muslim. <clears throat> he gave them Muslim names, Hussein and Michael. Okay? Now they become Muslim. And inshallah, they will blow themselves up when they grow up. Things of that kind. So the lady starts to put pressure on the husband to bring out his kids in. Okay. Now they have this kind of discussion. Okay, what, why do you want to bring out your kids as Muslims? Why don't we just give them the freedom to choose? And on the other hand, she's trying to influence the kids to be Christian. So some of these marriages fail mostly because of the children and the influence on the kids. So I got another, what? Another 10 minutes. So, uh, can you stay for another 10 minutes? Do you need a break for a couple of minutes? If you need a break for two minutes, raise your hand. Only one guy? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Be quiet. <laughs> okay. I'm going to make some points from a 50 or jurisprudence point of view. Number one. Divorce in Islam is acceptable, but it is the last resort. Islam does not encourage divorce. For example, if someone, for example, if, when you want, if you want to divorce your wife, you have to do it the Islamic way. And the Islamic way is, you have to divorce your wife outside her monthly period, and you have to do it once at a time. Like you give her three divorces, once at a time. Like you do it once today, and then you give back to your wife. Now you can do it another time, like six or seven months later. It is not acceptable Islamically, according to the opinion of the Muslim scholars, to divorce, to give your wife a final divorce instantly. You do it in stages. And this Islam, because of Islam, <coughs> cares about the families. Maybe you get mad at some point, you give your wife a divorce, so this counts as only one divorce. Even if you tell your wife, I divorced you 1,700,000 times, it counts only as one divorce. And this because of an authentic hadith from the Prophet that someone was sitting with the Prophet and he said, Oh Prophet of Allah, I want to divorce my wife three times. And he said, I divorced her, I divorced her, I divorced her. So the Prophet got mad and he said, Do you play? with the religion of Allah and I'm sitting in your midst. If you want to divorce your wife, divorce her 
once, then you still got two divorces to go. You may do them in the future, and you can take back your wife. Number two, the Sunni way, not the Bidri way of making talaq, is to divorce your wife outside of her monthly period. Because usually if the lady has, has her monthly period, she's not in a good mood, and the husband will not feel, you know, attached to his wife at this period. Okay? If you want to do it, then do it after she uh, takes a full shower. Some people think that living separately means divorce. They have a discussion. He didn't say, I divorce you. She goes to live with her mom for three years. He thinks that she is divorced, but Islamically, this is not a divorce. For someone to divorce his wife, he has to say, very clearly, I divorce you. Because one brother came to me, and he said, we have been living in different places for two years, three years, thinking, or actually that was the lady, and she came to me, she wants to get married. And I said, you are not even divorced. What are you talking about? If you are living in a different place for two, three years, it doesn't mean you are divorced. He has to give you divorce. What about conditional divorce? Conditional divorce. If the husband says to his wife, if you cook spaghetti again, I'm going to divorce you. This is called conditional divorce. We ask the husband, if he was just threatening, it doesn't count as a divorce. But he has to fast for three days if she cooks again. But it doesn't count as a divorce. But if he intended divorce, so divorce it will be. We have to ask him for his intention. It's called conditional divorce. As I said, divorcing the wife three times in one sitting counts only as one. If someone jokes with his wife, he, he divorces his wife jokingly, it counts as one divorce. Like this guy is having uh, a good time with his wife, and he's joking with her, and he said, you know honey, what, you're a divorce. It counts as a divorce. Because marriage is a very serious commitment in Islam, so you shouldn't take it lightly. If you say this, it's a divorce, but it's, uh, Re uh, revocable divorce, which means you can go back together. Before I open the floor for questions and answer, answers, and this is the last point, there is a difference between a minor, the minor divorce and major divorce, and I have to make this clear because it's very confusing for so many people. Say, if someone divorces his wife once, she has a waiting period for about three months until you know, she will have three waiting, wait, uh, three uh, monthly period in this time that she will take a shower three times. Then she is ready, you know, for a finalized divorce. During the three months, they can get back together. But if this period is over, it is called minor divorce, which means she is open to get married to anyone, including her husband. By Luna Sola, but with a new contract and a new dower. She can marry him again with a new marriage, a new uh, contract and a new dowry, and he will have to give her a marriage gift, and he has two, uh, two more divorces to go. And she can get married to another guy. Say, so, okay. He divorces her once, she got back to him within the period, then he gave her another divorce sometime after, then they came, they lived back together, he returned her, then after the, the second divorce, if he gives her a third divorce, then there's no coming back. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Abtalaqu Ma'ratani Fa'imsaqun Bima'rufin Al Tasirun Bi'ahsan. Divorce is two times. If you want to come give back to your wife after two divorces, it's fine. But after the third time, it's too late. Then after the waiting period for the third divorce, she will have to get married to another person. And if he so chooses to divorce her, then you can get back to her with a new marriage contract, a new dowry, and you have three divorces, three more divorces to go. Any questions? Questions? We'll give a candidate for every good question.
or go outside your house indecently as the people before Islam used to do. First of all, this ayah is talking to the wives of the Prophet. O wives of the Prophet. Number two, of course, we are required to follow in the footsteps of the wives of the Prophet and learn from their example. Number three, there is nothing wrong if the lady gets outside of the house as long as she abides by the Islamic etiquette. Like she is decent in her dress. Like she is talking in a decent way. Behaving properly. Okay? Like what is wrong with a Muslim lady going to the store to buy something for her family? I don't see anything wrong with this. The wives of the Prophet and were even the wives of the Sahaba will go outside to take care of some family business, provide for the family. As for working outside the house, I don't usually recommend it for wives to go outside the house and work. If they have children, if they have children, why would they go work as a teacher or a nurse and I'm not trying to offend anyone. We got some nurses and some teachers here. And you leave your kids, four or five of them, to be educated by al-Baqubi Okay? And you take the money from your job and you go and pay it to the daycare. Okay? And later you complain that your kids can't pray, that your kids are not behaving in an Islamic way. However, However, if we don't have in the Muslim community female doctors and female nurses, who is going to take care of our wives if they need attention and courtesy? Who? Who? So we need some female doctors and nurses and also in other places like female teachers to teach our children at kindergartens and daycares. Okay? Otherwise, it will be done by uh, non-Muslims or by males, for that matter, and which, for, with which most men, most of them are not comfortable if they have their wife, while she's pregnant, checked by a non-Muslim man. What even a Muslim man? Okay? I would rather have a non-Muslim lady check my wife than having a Muslim brother to check my wife. That's me. I don't know about you. The other thing is, personally speaking, my wife is a pediatrician. She treats children, if you're not familiar with the term. And she used to go to work in Egypt, half time, like twice or three times a week, for just four and five hours a day. She, she used to go to where she used to work, all the people there, the patients, the doctors, they are all women. And Muslim, alhamdulillah. So it's a good environment for my wife. And the, the work was just like two blocks from the house. She didn't have to take any uh, means of transportation to work. And of course, alhamdulillah, she was decent. The place where she used to work is decent. Why would I mind something like this? Okay? So you would let your wife work. If the work is proper for your wife, she will be serving the women in the community. And also, if you need your wife to work, sometimes the husband has some problems. He can't work and he needs someone to provide for the family if there is no welfare system. She can go to work as long as she is abiding by the Islamic etiquettes of going outside and working and providing for the family. The other thing is, and I conclude with this, في غزوة الوحد وفي غزوة الخندق بعض الصحابيات من النساء كنا يحاربن مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. Some of the wives of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet would go outside in the battles and fight with the Prophet like men. And some of them would do, they would be the nurses in the field. And there are so many names, and uh, Shifa, and so many other names, Rufayda, the first nurse in history. These are women. And they used to go outside with the Prophet and they participate in the battles and 
they take care of the wounded and, and, and so on and so forth. So there is nothing wrong Islamically if the lady goes to work. If the work is proper for her, there is no mixing between men and women and if they, if they need the wives to go to work. If things are tied for them, then this is accepted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Yes. Again? How do you tell them that you want to get married?
there's only one option, a Muslim man. And the reason is, the reason is, I, as a Muslim man, if I marry a Muslim or a Christian lady or a Jewish lady, are you Christian? Why are you raising your hand? Okay, sorry. Are you looking for a husband? Mid East, 
they think if someone proposed to their daughter that things don't work out, everybody in the community will think that there's something wrong with the girl. The blame is always on the girl, not on the boy. And this is the, the Arabic culture. Okay? So try to do things in an Islamic way, get the families involved from day two, not from day one, as long as you do it in an Islamic way. And we conclude with this, inshallah, if you have more questions, we uh, will get them the next time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to accept our good deeds, and to give us the best in this life, I mean, in the next life, and to accept our good deeds and reward us fully for them according to our intentions, and to forgive us anything we have done by ignorance, mistake, or forgetfulness. Whatever good I said in this presentation from Allah and His Prophet, Anything that, that is evil or wrong that I said today is from me, the shaitan, and from my reference books. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.